New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning, Laura Stiles, Rosenberg, and Eric Gonzalez, the district attorney of Brooklyn, New York City. Uh, now, um, I heard your name uh, when we had the untimely passing of Ken Thompson, and which kind of, for us, I know here, uh, he came up and was someone that we were supportive of. He gets the job as the Brooklyn District Attorney, uh, replacing somebody that had been in uh, the job for like 20-something years. And if you know anything about New York City, there's a lot of bad things and people who went to jail, different convictions and things that were just uh, not handled appropriately. Um, I believe racist um, and, you know, uh, the, the racist institution was kind of like uh, solidified by some of the individuals that have been district attorneys here around the tri-state for a long time. But we're living in a time where that's changing. We get somebody like Ken Thompson, who's uh, we believe in and is clearly making change, right? Like, get you know, uh, turning over convictions that were improperly handled, uh, people who were wrongfully convicted, getting them out of jail, um, uh, clearing warrants and things off of people records for, you know, for like turnstile jumping and just nuisance kind of crimes that teenagers get growing up in the city. Um, and he was active on that. And so your name comes up and I think I recall us being happy that you were somebody that worked for Ken Thompson, but we didn't know you. Um, and sometimes the people that are on the staff are just people who are on the staff but may not have the same, uh, I guess, initiatives. So you're here today and um, it's a pleasure to meet you. Good morning, and thank you for having me. I, yeah, look, Ken was my mentor, and Ken put me on as his chief assistant. That means I was number two in charge of the office, um, and we're still recovering from his passing. Uh, but the work continues. You know, one of the things when I ran for Brooklyn DA, I promised the people of Brooklyn that the legacy that Ken Thompson was starting in creating a fundamental fairness would continue. Um, and so that's why I'm on today, man, because I wanted to talk about some of the initiatives that we're working on in Brooklyn uh, to keep Brooklyn safe, but also to make sure that we have fundamental fairness and that we can start to strengthen trust in our justice system. Because too much of what's happened in the past has fallen, you know, on the backs of black and brown people. Um, and so some of the initiatives that Ken started, like wrongful convictions, we've vacated 24 so far. You know, 23 of them were either black or Hispanic. And, you know, the clearing of these warrants, you know, we know that predominantly 90 percent of the people who had these warrants were, you know, in Brooklyn, at least, were people of color. Um, and these warrants happen. Obviously, you don't as district attorney, you don't control how police police. You're in control of kind of the checks and balances of police officers and how they police. Am I articulating it right? We're, we're in charge of what the charges are going to be and whether or not to file the charges, but not the policing strategies or how when the police decide to make an arrest. But we can choose not to bring charges um, if we believe that the arrest was inappropriate. How incestuous has the relation, you know, because, you know, as outsiders to your industry, I guess for lack of a better term, us as civilians, we look at you guys all as friends, all kind of helping each other. Um, and if you as the district attorney are, quote unquote, in bed with the NYPD, but the NYPD's policing strategies are off, you're basically helping them fast forward an agenda that might that we may disagree with as people. Correct. So when I ran for D.A., I, was, I think I was probably the first person in New York City that said, you know, at the time I was running, critical of broken windows policing and critical of the way stop and frisk was being handled because I grew up in East New York. Um, I moved to East New York when I was 10 years old from Williamsburg, Bushwick. And, you know, I saw in my lifetime that although we had a lot of crime and our families wanted to be safe, you know, we often had tension, a lot of tension with the police department. And it was important for someone like me to come into the office because I always thought we needed more people who came from my background, who looked like me and had my experience to say what was fair and what wasn't fair in policing. Um, as the DA now, you know, I have a role in making sure that the policies of today are policies that are fair to all people. And, you know, our communities deserve to have a voice in how we want to be 
policed and how what we believe safety looks like. Uh, we can't have outsiders always di- dictating what safety should look like for our communities. To Ebro's point, though, in theory, should a healthy relationship between a DA and a police department be that sometimes you see eye to eye and sometimes you're like, no, and you're fighting over you know specific things? Yeah, and I think you're seeing that today. I think what you're seeing in today in New York City is the police department has come along in a lot of ways and they've made a lot of progress from a few years ago, uh, but there are still things that DAs are doing today. Um, the non-prosecution of marijuana cases and, you know, the non-prosecution of some fair evasion cases that, you know, probably the- Fair evasion. Oh, that's yeah. jumping a turnstile. Yeah. yeah. Got it. That, you know, the police department probably would think uh, is, you know, not the strategy that they would like. Got it. Um, right now, um, in Brooklyn Sunset Park, I believe there was just a bust of seven, or I don't know what the number was, police officers who were involved in a gambling ring and a prostitution or or were allowing one to exist. I don't know what the whole charge is. Um, you know, you know, these things like that are things that will fall on your desk, correct? Well, that case is actually a Queens case because the officers were running, um, the allegations were that they were running brothels from, in Brooklyn and Queens. And so that case is being handled um, by the Queens District Attorney's Office. But again, these are the kind of cases that DAs make a big difference on because we have to also um, make sure that we're policing the police. Um, there's also, I noticed the other day, you your office, Brooklyn, Manhattan, I believe, and maybe just you guys were the two offices that were outspoken along with the mayor's office about not prosecuting low-level marijuana charges. But I did not see the Bronx, Queens DA, or Staten Island DA, and we know what Staten Island's all about. Um, I did not see those offices say they were going to do the same. Am I correct in noticing that? All five DA's offices have different electeds and they have different priorities. You know, for me, it's clear that this enforcement of marijuana um, laws have had a disproportionate impact on black Latinos in particular in our city and in my county in Brooklyn, 90 percent of the people who get arrested for smoking marijuana or possession of marijuana are either black or Latino. Can you, I work with a lot of kids, and um, can you explain for the people who are going to watch this, right, um, the amount of time you can get right now for a possession of marijuana? Because I also read that THC oil is different. It's classified different than a marijuana leaf. Is that correct? Right. Well, in Brooklyn, we're, for the most part, we're no longer prosecuting marijuana cases, and that's the announcement that Ibro was talking about that Done. Manhattan and I wow. um, have said we're not going to prosecute possession cases. Now, I will still handle a case if someone is smoking, you know, some marijuana and they're driving a car, you know, they're causing, you know, risk to people's lives. That's a right. different thing. But simple possession, people who are smoking in Brooklyn, we're no longer going to prosecute those cases. Now, there is a difference, and we've talked about this on the air. If you're a nuisance, like meaning you're standing in front of someone's home, you know, you are, um, you know, being a uh, disruptive in some kind of way. It would be the same thing that would happen if you were drinking alcohol outside and making a bunch of noise, standing on the block, standing, sitting on someone's stoop, uh, obstructing the pathway, the walkway, these kind of things. Obviously, a police officer is going to say, hey, man, you can't do this here. And if it becomes a thing in that moment, it may become something else. Well, I'm hoping that it doesn't come to an arrest, that it comes to either a warning or that the police officer will issue a summons. Uh, you know, I support um, issuing of summonses for smoking. Listen, you can't, even if you have legalization, right, when most states who have legalization, yeah, it's still illegal to smoke on a yeah. public street. Right. So the officers should issue a summons. But I don't think you need to send someone to central booking for 24 hours at Rikers Island because they're in possession of uh you know, of marijuana. Now, these summonses, unfortunately, still are criminal summonses. Maybe we can get to the day where our legislature or our city council moves to create an option for a civil summons. So right now, if you have an open container of beer, when the police write you that summons, it's going to be a civil summons, meaning that you are not going to get a uh, the potential of a criminal record. 
these SAP summonses are still warrants that – I mean, they're still summonses that could equal a criminal conviction. Right. Um, and I, I don't think we need to have people criminalized for marijuana possession. Um, and then there's still the issue is if your intent to distribute is a whole other level. Well, that's right. It. Like if you got small bags yes, yes. in your pocket, right, that's going to be interpreted as the intent to sell those. Like if you have 20 bags in your pocket or something like that. Well, for us in Brooklyn, it's really about people who are moving in weight. We had a case about a year ago where some guy from – was bringing in an uh, 18-wheeler full of marijuana from California. <laughs> That's a different you guys case. You guys didn't look past that. Right. that hit. Well, it's just a little recreational. It's just a little you know, recreational, 18-wheeler. Right? Right. my friends. <laughs> that, those are... My 10,000 best friends and I. Was... Yeah, but we, we want to move Just away. having a party, Eric. We, come we on. Want, <laughs> we want to move away from prosecuting um, marijuana cases. And let me, let me explain. These cases are time-consuming. They take police officers off patrol for hours at a time to write up the paperwork. Um, these, it costs approximately $2,000 in arrest to process these cases. They come to court. They tie up assistant DAs. They tie, tie up our, our correctional officers. And at the end of all of this, most cases get dismissed. So we're really just punishing people um, there is not a public safety value of doing that, except for what you said, Ebro. Like, if there's someone who gets lights up at 7 a.m. on an MTA bus and is, you know, you know, being, you know, so inconsiderate of everyone else, I can understand an officer doing what they need to do there. But most cases, um, and what we saw in stop and frisk was people were being stopped. Asked, you have anything in your pocket? Someone say, oh, "Yeah, I have a little marijuana," and then they were being put through the system. We have to, we have to, we had to stop that. Now, the putting through the system combo, which you're hearing a lot about, ending cash bail, uh, bail reform in the criminal justice reform conversation. My interpretation of being put through the system meant that a lot of people would get paid along the way. Right? It was a racket. It's you know this. Defense guy's getting paid. The, the desk clerk, you got to pay the $25 over here. So that's income for somebody. You know, the bail. the bail, they're getting some money. Like, it was a whole racket of criminalizing people because a lot of people got money on that. Are you in support of reforming that because you see the same thing? I do. Listen, I think that we need and we are, and we've started in Brooklyn, um, to put a lot less people in jail in general. And our criminal justice system should be devoted to people who are dangerous to us, who are going to bop us over the head or, you know, hurt our families. And we need to take a lot of these offenses out of the justice system and deal with them in different ways like we're going to do with marijuana. Very good. That makes sense. Um, the district attorney of Brooklyn is Eric Gonzalez. Do you um, – there's a lot that you can't get done without the passing of the rec – recreational marijuana laws, right? So you can't reduce something if the law's the law. Right. Well, one of the things that I've done is is saying I'm not going to prosecute these marijuana possession cases anymore. And the, it's still illegal. Like, I want everyone to understand that marijuana is still illegal. We've decriminalized it in the sense that we're not prosecuting uh, the majority of these cases. Uh, we've reduced marijuana prosecutions in Brooklyn by over 90% in the last few months. Um, but it's still illegal. And so people have to understand that if they're smoking in public, that a police officer is probably going to take action against them. That being said, uh, one of the things I can do as the DA is help set priorities. And so we are going to this weekend, Friday and Saturday, um, up in Lenox Baptist uh, Lenox Road Baptist Church in East Flatbush, we're going to go back and give people who've been either given a summons for marijuana in the past and failed to pay that ticket or show up to court, um, people who have misdemeanor bench warrants for them, and people who have been convicted of marijuana an opportunity um, to clear this. So for the summons warrants, we're going to vacate them. For people who have misdemeanor bench warrants, we're going to vacate those uh, bench warrants and deal with the underlying offense. Um, I see those cases getting dismissed. And then for the first time, and really, it, um, really, this is a big deal because it's never been done in the state before, 
people who've been convicted, giving an opportunity to vacate those convictions, making sure that those um, convictions, a lot of them, which came during the stop and frisk era, are getting a chance to clear their names. So I show up to a location, okay, and you're telling me that I shouldn't fear that I'm going to be arrested no. No, for something not. if I show up here and I'm like, hi, everyone. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so what happens is— Y'all not taking me to jail today, right? <laughs> no. So what happens, we, we've done, <laughs> we've had the clearing the warrants. Because uh, I'm going to tell you right now, it sounds good what you're saying. If I had any of those things, I'm like, yo, y'all got an app? I, I definitely would love to do this <laughs> anonymously yeah, yeah. On the app. <laughs> online or somewhere else. Because showing up, parking my car, walking down a block when I got a warrant and I know there's police there— so the police I'm skeptical. So the police department is a partner in this aspect. Um, they will not arrest anyone who's coming um, to the church uh, we'll to clear their warrants. We've done this five times already, okay. and we've cleared thousands. Well, we've promoted some of them, right. and we've th- we've cleared thousands of these warrants. You know, there was over a million summons warrants. Regular, ordinary New Yorkers who have warrants because they walked the dog off a leash or they rode a bike on a sidewalk. They were in the park after dark. And they get a pink ticket. They don't pay the ticket. They don't come to court. And the, that's not even a crime. What they were charged with is not even a crime. But the failure to deal with the ticket then turns into a, an arrest warrant. And when a police officer comes across the person, they have to arrest them. And so that I don't think you got pulled over for something random like cell phone. Now all of a sudden they see the thing, and you got to go in. Yeah, you have, to, and you're going to be in there for 19, 20 hours. And it doesn't create public trust. No. Right. And, and it, you know, sometimes people are victims of crime and they can't even report the crime, their crime because they know they have this warrant from years ago. Wow. I met a young man at one of the begin agains that Ken Thompson did. And he's, that's what you guys call him. Begin again. The program. Begin again. Start begin. over. You know, but it's called begin again program. And this young man, you know, he was like 23 years old or so. He said, now nah, I can finally get my driver's license because I was afraid to go into DMV because I knew I had this warrant. Mm. Um, and so he cleared the warrant. Um, but no one gets arrested. Um, we have legal aid attorneys that are there. They represent you. It's a real courtroom, but it's set up inside the church. There's real judges. And you don't need a penny. You, if you don't have any money, I know, listen, growing up in Brooklyn, I know a lot of times people don't come to court because they don't have the money for the fines or the court fees, and they're afraid that the judge is going to throw them in jail. This doesn't work like that. You don't need money. You, you know, There's a free lawyer there for you, and we are going to vacate the warrant. No matter what happens, you're going to get your warrant vacated. Laura, you got anything you want to? I mean, no, I mean warrants. I know you got some questions, but you're good. I'm good. Rosenberg, you've been good. You ain't never lived in Brooklyn anyway. No, but I think it's an important message. Shawnee. Well. Brooklyn. Wow. I'm good. But people and, need to understand that because this is an opportunity. You mean, all, y'all are just trying to clear up your yeah, stuff. It's huge. Yeah. And, and but like you said, I'm glad that you pointed out that people are definitely intimidated, definitely scared because of the same reasons that we mentioned. You sure, y'all don't want to do this on an app. <laughs> But it's important for the people to hear that this is huge because, hello, this can help you with employment, with your record, with everything. Well, you, you said it, Laura. And listen, um, for our immigrant brothers and sisters, whether they un- undocumented or they're here on green cards, ICE will enforce these warrants, right? So you have a, a warrant for smoking a cigarette too close to the building or – you know, whatever, some some low-level offense, and ICE sees that you have a warrant for your arrest, we've seen ICE enforcement on this. So not only is this— ICE not going to be at this because they're— No, they can't. They That's one thing that ICE Hold is good. Hold me down, Eric. That's if I show up and ICE is there— No, ICE will not be there because they um, treat churches as sensitive locations. And so they've made an agreement— um, and they've honored that agreement so far that they don't make arrests at churches. No. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we do it in churches. Everyone always asks me, why do you do these at churches? Because sometimes people feel uncomfortable coming into a church. I think it's important to do it at a church because I think it allows people to feel confident they're not going to get arrested. But also, we also know that ICE will not make enforcement actions no, at So church. ICE is really Satan. They can't even go in church. Yeah, they melt <laughs> They melt when they show up to ISIS church. ISIS is really Satan. They can't go to church. This is crazy. ISIS is the devil. Um, 
Wow, okay, cool. And if you're afraid to go to a church, maybe you're the devil too. Let's, I mean, maybe you need to keep those warrants if you're so, afraid to show up to a church. Yeah. And, and I really want to, I'm telling folks right now, if you have a conviction for marijuana possession, there are over 20,000 people in Brooklyn alone who have taken a conviction for possession of marijuana, a misdemeanor conviction. You can come, you'll, you'll be met with a free legal aid or Brooklyn Defender Service lawyer. They will help you navigate the paperwork. You don't even have to come to court. Mm. The court system has agreed that the person won't have to show up to court. They'll just fill out the paperwork. My office will help take care of it and process it in court with wow. the attorneys, and you can get your record cleared. In your role as attorney uh, or district attorney, um, do you go on record and talk about what's going on statewide, citywide that you agree and disagree with? Or are you the type of guy that's like, look, Brooklyn's my zone. I focus on Brooklyn. Like, Because there's been some uh, uh, Senate seats that have changed over in this whole IDC breakup thing that happened locally, which many of us are happy about. Um Obviously, uh, on this show, we were Cynthia, definitely Cynthia Nixon because we just felt like Cuomo was more of the same and not progressive um, and, and not, um, not really ready to uh, deal with some of the issues that New York City's having, you know, because upstate New York doesn't really give a good goddamn about the city that much. So the rules for... Listen, I'm a Democrat, but the rules for me as a district attorney... I, I have to follow the rules that apply to judges, which means I'm not allowed to campaign or endorse mm. uh, other political candidates. I can't attend political activity unless it's a year that I'm running because I am an elected official. Yeah. Every four years, I, I'm allowed to do some of that work. But I do speak out on issues that I think um, involve my role as DA. So you know, I came out early in support of raising the age I've come out in support of bail reform. You know, I've been doing bail reform in Brooklyn. We need the legislature to act on it. I believe we can get to a no-cash bail system. And uh, quickly right there, um, bail reform and no-cash bail system means exactly what, if you don't understand what that means? Well, right now when people become go before a judge, if they're considered a flight risk, um, or the evidence is very heavy and they're looking at a lot of jail time and the judge or, or DA thinks that possibly they're not going to return to court on their own, the judge um, may impose a, a monetary cash bail amount. And that means that you, know, you may get a $5,000 bail put on your case. If you don't have the money, you're going to get stuck inside Rikers waiting for your trial. If you have money, you're going to get out. There are other places in the country that have different systems um, that don't require people um, to have to put up money to get out of jail um, to fight their case. And so I think in Brooklyn, you know, we've tried to reduce the time, the number of times we ask for bail. Um, we have obviously dangerous people in Brooklyn. We have people who aren't going to return to court on their own. And so, you know, my office does ask for bail on appropriate cases and especially cases of violence. Uh, but on a lot of this low-level um, stuff, I don't think that we need bail at all. Um, and so we have to reform the system because, you know, listen, you know, the numbers are fairly clear. Um, a lot of people of color in particular get stuck inside Rikers Island because they don't have $1,000. And so we need to end that system. Mm. And how do we go about in this, this whole, uh, I guess, closing of Rikers that's supposed to happen? Um, from what you know, it's happening. Sure. I supported it. Um, but does that, and then the initial, I guess, take that and then add in what you as a district attorney are doing in Brooklyn, we start to improve that environment in around, because Rikers is really indicative of a greater New York issue and our systems that have people stuck there for, as you put, $1,000 for until your trial comes up, which could be, Six months. Right. And I think the other part of that is a lot of times people just want to get out. And so they plead guilty because um, it's easier to plead guilty and get out than fight your case. And that's no one wants that. No one wants anyone pleading guilty simply because they can't afford to get out. But on the Rikers Island part of this, 
you know, I think every every borough should have to deal with their own um, criminal justice population. Got it. And so closing Rikers now puts it borough specific. Right. And put the people in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, let their families come see them in Brooklyn. Let them be right next to our courthouse. We spend millions of dollars transporting people from Rikers Island. Um, but we have to change the culture, not only building a new prison, but bringing all the cultural baggage with it will create a smaller Rikers Island in Brooklyn. It's, we have to reimagine what our you know prison should look like, and I think there's a lot of work going, you know, studying this issue. How do we make our prisons a more humane place? His name is Eric Gonzalez. He's a district attorney in Brooklyn. Nobody has any warrants, anything we need to negotiate clear, right man. now. We good. We're clear. It's been real. It's been really nice. You know, nobody oh, plans good. on transporting an eighteen wheeler. Nope. 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 Of weed. Okay. Anybody okay. shiny? No. Anything, no. anything you got. They it's, still stopping you over there. Is this um not I need an extra PBA card. You got one of those? <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, oh, talk to talk, to, talk to me after. Talk to me after. But <laughs> listen, listen to the people out there. Um one thing I forgot to say is if you have one of these pink tickets, these summons war- summonses, you don't need to have gotten that in Brooklyn. Anywhere in the five boroughs of New York City, oh, you can funny. come to Lenox Road Baptist Church this Friday or Saturday from nine to three and get that ticket vacated and cleared and move on with your life and not have to worry about getting locked up anytime you want to. Ice not going to be there. Nobody's so going to lock you up. You know what I'm saying? Don't smoke a, a joint setup. outside. It's Do not, not come up smelling like Thank weed. You. I wouldn't suggest that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Fun.